Welcome to Resume Storyteller with Virginia Franco, bringing you interviews with industry experts and regular folks who tested the job search waters and succeeded, and strategies to tell your story and land your job interviews in 60 days, guaranteed. Here's your host, Virginia Franco. I'm delighted to introduce my latest guest, Sarah Dyer. Sarah began her career transition after 14 years with a Fortune 500 bank, where she'd worked in a variety of product, sales, relationship management roles. In 2016, she made a career leap to focus on training, which was a component of past roles that she'd always loved. She became a sales retail learning specialist for a financial services company and then changed industries completely to take on a new role in training in 2017. Today, she is the training manager for Nearmap, a high-tech provider of high-resolution aerial imagery, and is relied on for training strategies that increase adoption, improve performance, and grow revenues. So, Sarah, welcome. Thank you, Virginia. I'm glad to be here. So, you know, I just gave a quick bio explaining your career history as I know it. If you wouldn't mind, give us a quick overview of your career history. Sure, I would love to. So I was a finance major in college. And when I graduated, I thought it would be a logical progression to want to work in the banking industry. So that I made sense. that a reality. And, <laughs> and I, I did that by actually moving myself to Charlotte, North Carolina, which at the time was the hub on the East Coast beyond New York City, of course, for, for banking. And it was a positive change, especially having grown up in Maine and went to college in Maine and spent pretty much my whole formative years there. It was time to make a change. So I was successful in landing my first career with Bank of America. And I had the opportunity to work in many different channels and lines of business throughout my tenure there. And I got to learn a lot about myself throughout those experiences. And I've worked in many different cities throughout that tenure as well. And it wasn't until it was a personal choice to move to Salt Lake City, where I currently reside, that prompted a, a larger change, not only to leave the company, but to also focus specifically on training, having joined a brokerage firm and now having joined a staff company. I finally found my niche. This is the um, transition that I've been desiring to do for my whole entire career and brought me to where I am today. Wow. So you, through a series of sort of micro pivots, you were able to make that more, larger career leap that you had planned. And I don't think I realized that you'd planned that all along. What was it that propelled you to, you know, you moved, you moved to Salt Lake City and you decided that that's where you wanted to reside. What was it that made you say, you know what, I'm ready to start making these moves? Yeah, that's a good question because oftentimes when you think of a career change, it isn't necessarily only the career decision that is changing. There's a lot of other variables and things that happen in the background. Oftentimes it could be a spouse or children or other relationships. And those are definitely all factors in my life. So yeah, that's a really good point. Just just me making a decision. It was what's right for me and my family. And everybody involved. So ultimately, it, that was what prompted us in I Am Married. So me and my husband to move to Salt Lake City was the lifestyle. Interestingly enough, I was able to maintain my position when I moved to Salt Lake City from Texas. So I had the comfort of having that position, but it just, it wasn't necessarily working now that I was in the same state that my job required me to be in. So it was definitely a change that had to happen for me personally. So I also took that as the opportunity to say, what do I want to do? How do I want to spend my time? What am I good at? What am I passionate about? And that's what led me to focus specifically on training. And it helped me refine my search and really pinpoint things specifically that I was looking forward to just from day-to-day activities. So ultimately, what's my goal for the next one, three, five years, and it all centered around training. Okay, so you did a pretty in-depth sort of self-analysis to say, you know what, I've done all these things, training is what makes the most sense. Absolutely. 
And it, did you do that on your own or did you go, did you do like a person analysis test? How did you, how did you yeah. try that? Yeah, no, it was a lot of time of self-reflection and just assessing the situation that I was in with the role that I was in at the time. And I, I loved it, loved everything about it. <clears throat> but when you make a change to relocate to a new city, and can't maintain that position forever. So I knew change was coming. I was preparing myself mentally for that. So I took that opportunity to just have self-reflection time. And that was over the course of a few months, too. So it's not anything that necessarily happens overnight. So what steps did you take to begin making that transition? You got to read. You got to read and you got to be curious. You got to really understand the industry that you're looking to get into or even the job that you're looking to get into if you're not making a career change. You just, you really have to understand everything about it because when you make that decision to make a change, there's a lot of impact from that. So I like to arm myself with all the information so that I can make the most logical decision, of course, but my heart also has to be in it. And my head's got to be in it as well. And you really got to understand your value and how it fits into whatever job or industry that you're looking to get into. You got to make sure that those two are the right fit together. So you got to get to know what's happening in your field of interest and you've got to ask a lot of questions. You got to get curious. In terms of doing that research, was it reaching out to people? Was it reading? Was, you know, was it all of the above? It was all of the above. Initially, it starts with a lot of reading and specifically going out on LinkedIn. It's a great source of knowledge, not only from people's personal bios, but companies' bios. You can see who people are following. It's kind of like this rabbit hole sometimes where yeah, you yeah. start clicking around and then you discover information and you may be looking for something completely different. But sometimes it's good to follow those rabbit holes because without it, I don't think I would be here today. And it's just getting curious and, and seeing what people are following, what people are talking about, what's of interest right now, specifically in the field that I was looking to get into. I wanted to educate myself more on it and know a lot about a lot of things so that when I was ready to go and make the next step to the interview process, I actually knew what I was talking about and could demonstrate yeah. my value, particularly having come from a different background than those people. So what was your biggest challenge making this kind of a change? Honestly, patience. <laughs> so really, yeah. Yeah. So sometimes when you commit to making a change, that's a big hurdle and that's a big step. And oftentimes we expect the change to happen immediately and that's unrealistic. So when I say patience, you've got to have the patience to be able to, to be smart and ask a lot of questions and, again, get curious and talk to other people. But you also have to know what the right fit is going to be. And the only way you're going to be able to do that is you've got to know yourself and you've got to stay in the present and you've got to know and be thoughtful about opportunities, but not necessarily worry about things that could happen. It's taking the information that comes in and being present with it and knowing what to do with that information. A lot of time can be wasted by worrying about things that you don't necessarily have any control over. So right. when I say patience, it's patience with yourself. Yeah. Okay. No, that, yeah. And with, with yourself and with the process. Exactly. No, that makes a ton of sense. So I mean, obviously you... Right, right. So obviously you had a day job while you were going through this. So how did you structure, what did your job search look like sort of on a daily, weekly, monthly basis? Yeah. So that's the challenge, honestly, is the demands of life and of your existing job can easily get in the way. But thankfully now we've all, pretty much hopefully all of us have smartphones. So there's a lot True. of <laughs> that, that we have access to right at our fingertips. So I would say take advantage of the five minutes here and there that you can get and just start researching. And then oftentimes I would make little notes for myself so that when I had additional time to spend that I could do a little bit more in-depth research. So at, at least I always had an ongoing list 
for myself okay. of things to pick up where I left off. So it, it wasn't necessarily, oh, I'm going to spend at least an hour a day. I very well may have spent more than an hour a day, but it's going to be in like five minute chunks throughout so the chunk. day. Okay. Yeah. So, so those, those five minutes would allow you to write little notes so that when you had bigger blocks of time, you knew exactly where to dive in. Absolutely. Oh, and, I love that. That's really smart. Yeah, you know, oftentimes it's going to be nighttime. Kids go to bed. Yeah, or, or not. <laughs> or not. When they don't go to bed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. So you just, you got to be a little flexible. Okay. So what was it that surprised you most during this journey? What did you I not expect? Say, yeah, I would say how easy it is to make a change after being with one company for so long. I have yeah, 14 years is such a long time. And I know it is. And I think I was fearful or I was always the fake one in the relationship. So, you know, my spouse had a few more job changes than I did, specifically the company. So he was the riskier one. I was the more stable one. And it worked for us. But once I found out that you can make a change, it's actually pretty easy once you do the legwork. Again, there's a lot of work that goes into it. But once you know you found the right fit and once you've prepared yourself and that you can provide that value of yourself and you've got that passion to fill that role, it just it becomes so easy and the rest kind of just takes care of itself. Was, did you ever face resistance around people saying, well, you don't know my industry or you haven't been, you know, a formal trainer before. You know, how did you deal with stuff like that? Yeah. So that was definitely a reality and a hurdle I had to overcome. So what I did was educated myself on the role. So prior to even going into an interview where I knew that that would come up, I prepared myself. Okay. So I looked at what the job description was position I was interviewing for. And I looked at my own history and my own resume. And sometimes you have to modify and change things a little bit to match what specifically you're targeting. So it's not necessarily a one size fits all. I would say that's right. great for LinkedIn. But when you're looking at your resume itself and trying to prove your value, you've got to look and match up experiences and pull. And I would say get creative. And I don't want to say that to mean lying, but get creative and think of like what you've done and how it relates to whatever the role is that you're looking to get into. Because oftentimes there's huge benefit of not having come from that background necessarily because you've got these other experiences and you're solving a problem. And ultimately how you solve it and how creative you get with that is something that's highly desirable. Instead of someone who's had the same history, the same experiences, I mean, it's not going to get much yeah. change. No, that was a really good point. So did you have more of your success meeting with people and sort of articulating your value that way? Or was, you know, what kind of success did you have just sort of applying online? Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's a challenge. Cause it's because computer systems are not designed to take risks on people. The way humans no. are. No, they're certainly not. So you've got to take those extra steps and you've got to be proactive and you've got to advocate for yourself. So you've got to get curious about who the hiring manager is, who's in the position today or someone similar that you can interview. And at least, A, that, that helps you understand the position better, but it also helps True. potentially give you an advocate inside the company for the job that you're applying for. So you've definitely got to make those personal connections because it's just submitting an application or your resume online is like the big black hole of you know, yep. nothing. Okay. So okay. yeah, you've got to be your own personal advocate. Okay. No, I love that. So you might've answered my question, but what advice would you give for someone looking to make a jump into training? I'll say, cause you know, you've really shown success now doing this across a couple of industries. Yep. So it might sound like a broken record, but you mm -hmm. never stop learning. So never I'm in the business of knowledge sharing, ultimately, is what training is and preparing sure. people to be functionally proficient in their roles. But, you know, I think of it more than that, especially the learning and development. So you've got to keep up with industry trends and enablement tools to make 
your job easier. And you've got to know how to be resourceful and, again, provide that value. And okay. with learning and development, it's oftentimes difficult to align directly to an organization's bottom line. So be creative in how you address that and have an honest conversation about that as well. So give me an example. So an example, and I've faced this before, where I've been in learning organizations where sometimes if a company is looking to make budget cuts, unfortunately, in the L and D directly, yes, right. <laughs> the bottom line, you're oftentimes the first to go. So being knowledgeable about that and having ideas about how the behaviors that you do impact and instill in, for example, your salespeople who directly impact the bottom line. So correlate that together and say, by doing this, we'll increase revenue this way. And, you know, dollar signs go off and they say, oh, okay, this is hugely beneficial. So it's just a different perspective. No, that's a good point. And that shows that you understand the strategic value of what you're bringing to the table and and what the company's goal is. Exactly. You sort of the cog that you play in that big machinery. What would be, you know, you're giving advice to someone who's making a jump into any industry. What are sort of one or two tools that you believe were essential in your job search? Number one is LinkedIn. It is the best tool. Did you pay for it? I did. Yeah. I okay. found that to be hugely beneficial. Just okay. the additional insights, access, and ability to send in mail directly to people. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it just, it helps you be so much more proactive, which you've got to advocate for yourself. And you've got to know that sometimes it's not going to be reciprocated or, <laughs> or even acknowledged. So you just, kind of have to get over it. And for those who do reply and engage, you know, thank them profusely for their time. <laughs> because it's what kind of ROI did you get on those emails? <laughs> Honestly, I would say it was 20% or less. Yeah, that's about right. But all you need is yeah. two people and okay. Exactly. Okay. Oh, yeah, that's good. But the other thing is you've got to be passionate about what you're doing and the industry that you want to get into. Sometimes it's easy to think that grass is always greener somewhere else, and that's yeah. never the case. So be realistic and really understand and educate yourself on that industry and know the pros and cons going in so that you're not disappointed when you know, the first bump in the road happens. So when you went from financial services to SAS, do you feel like your research really prepared you for the interview and for and for the role that you're in now? It did. And I'm also learning way more about SAS organizations now that I'm in it as well. So okay. I'm definitely eyes wide open, taking the opportunity to still, again, it's an ongoing learning process. Excellent. So what is something, this is my favorite fun question, What's something that you think might surprise people about you or something that did surprise people when you were interviewing? I would say I'm pretty pragmatic when it comes to my career decisions. And I'm not that way in my personal life. <laughs> As you can see, I've, <laughs> I've lived in a few different places throughout my career. And oftentimes, there were personal choices that came along with those decisions. Sure. And I was way more risky when it came to my personal life than it did to my career. So finally, recently, I decided it was time to balance that and be a little bit more risky. Time to align those a little bit. Yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> oh, I love that. So you took your new role in the fall. Tell me what's next for you. Currently, I'm at a company. We're actually global. We're based in Australia. So I've got my sights on more of a global role to leverage my background and my passion and bring global learning enablement for not only our U.S. operations, but Australia as well. Wow. So you foresee maybe an overseas move in your future? I don't know. I think if the time is right and it's the right thing for my family, then absolutely. Okay. All right. Taking it sort of beyond the U.S. though. I love that. Yes. Well, Sarah, thank you so much. You've given some really actionable advice that I actually haven't heard from other people before. So thank you. My sense is that your ability to effectively make career pivots with a strategy that 
it's pragmatic, but it's also courageous because you recognize that you've got to reach out to people and you might not always get the response to you that you want, but just sort of that understanding that perseverance, I, I think that will resonate with a lot of people. So I appreciate you taking the time to speak with me today. Absolutely. You've been listening to Resume Storyteller with Virginia Franco. To learn more about storytelling strategies to catch the eye of today's skim online readers, hiring and decision makers, go to www.virginiafrancoresumes.com.